This is Mary, and she's one of our educators here at Jamestown Settlement. And Mary used to be a classroom science teacher. I did, I loved it, and now I get to do some science at Jamestown, because you can use a little science to understand what happened in history. In primary sources, like journals and letters, we can read the observations and reactions of the colonists who sailed from England and landed in a place they would call Virginia in 1607. One colonist, Gabriel Archer, described the depth and length of this river that they would later name after King James. He described the abundance of fish and sturgeon, as well as the size and superior taste of crabs and oysters. George Percy announced that on the 13th day, they settled in land of the Paspahay tribe, where they tied their ships to trees and sixth fathom of water. Of the river they would name after King James, he said it was the famousest river mentioning beautiful strawberries, delicate flowers, and the goodliest woods he had ever seen. He called this land paradise. These three English ships landed in the heart of Senecamaca, home of the Powhatan Paramount Chiefdom. Powhatan settlements were located on areas upriver with fertile soil. The river was a lifeline for the Powhatan offering fish and shellfish, water for drinking, bathing, and irrigating crops. And the river was a major highway for trade and travel throughout Senecamaca. Over the course of the summer months in Virginia, Percy's tone begins to change. On the 6th of August, he writes that John Aspie died of the bloody flux. Then three days later, another man, George Flower, dies of the swelling. He will come to record 19 deaths in August alone, stating, There were never Englishmen left in a foreign country in such misery as we were in this newly discovered Virginia. He says our drink, cold water taken out of the river, which was at flood very salt, and at a low tide full of slime and filth, which was the destruction of many of our men. Why was the water sweet when the colonists arrived in May? but slime and filth by August. Let's use science to find out in this episode of Hands on History, the Science of the James River. And today we're gonna to be talking about what happened to the colonists when they first arrived in 1607. We know that they sampled the river, meaning they just tasted it, and they said that it was pretty good. It didn't taste salty and it seemed to be clear. So they're gonna start drinking the James River on a regular basis. Now, we know that that's what they did because primary sources written down tell us that. Well, things did change though because they didn't know that as the river gets hotter during the summer, it's going to change drastically. So what we want to do is set up an experiment to show you what happens to the James River as we go through the 12 months of the year. But you probably already know that this part of Virginia is the coastal plain, and it's also called the tide water, which means we have high and low tides in the river. And you know when the ocean comes in, it's going to bring salty water. So very salty water coming in on high tides from the ocean is going to meet fresh water coming down from the mountains. And where they meet sometimes is right at Jamestown. So let's see what happens if the river changes. So the first thing we've done, we can't just go to the river right now and do this. So I've got fresh water here as if it's coming from the mountains and we have colored it blue because blue is gonna stand for fresh water. Over here, I've got salt water and we added the salt to it, but pretend like this is ocean water coming up at high tide. We've added salt to that to show that it is very salty and we made that red. Now, here's a word, if you haven't learned it yet, you're going to, you have to understand something called density. Density means how thick is something, how many molecules or particles are crammed into one space. So I want you now to think, the only thing in this water is H2O, fresh water, and the only thing in this water is H2O, but we added salt to this one. So if we added salt to this one, this one is going to be denser than that one. Okay, now my assistant's going to come over and we're going to pour the water into these two sections and listen. 
We're kind of making the river, but the river doesn't have a divider in it. But we do this for an experiment. So let's watch. And my assistant, and we're going to pour these at the same time in here and try not to spill them, Mary. <laughs> so I tried to make sure there are no leaks. Okay, I think that's just about right. Keep going, Catherine. Okay. So this is when you make your hypothesis. Now think, I'm going to pull this up very slowly. What do you think is going to happen? Some might say they're going to change color. Some are going to say they're going to mix. Some are going to say they're just going to stay there. So you make your hypothesis. And now we're going to pull this up very slowly. I tell you what, I'm going to hold it and you pull it okay. up slowly. And let's just give it a few seconds to see what happens. You could probably go a little faster, assistant. <laughs> oh. Look at that. So, what seems to be happening? Where is the blue water that's the fresh water? And you can see, you're right, it's on the surface, and the heavier or the denser salt water has gone below. So we know that things like this really do happen, not set up like this, but that's why we do experiments. That salt water is going down, down, down. It will take sediment like clay that makes the water murky and turbid, that's the word. It also can make the, water, the things like bacteria. I bet you've heard of E. coli sometimes, it makes you very, very sick. E. coli, algae, all these things can be brought down by the heavy salt water. Now here's the thing. The English have no idea what's going on in the river, but by the end of summer, by July and into August, they go down to the river, we assume, because remember, we weren't there. But we think they just go down to the river with a bucket and they just scoop. So imagine if you were one of those colonists and you went to the river and said, well, yeah, the surface looks pretty good, it looks clear, let's just scoop some water up. <gasps> oh, they're scooping up is serious bacteria, E. coli down here, and it's gonna make them very, very sick. The name of that sickness, get ready for this, is the bloody flux. And that really means something terrible. And I'm gonna say these words because, well, it's what happens. They get diarrhea and dysentery, and you can die from that, as many of them did. So we think this is what happened to the colonists, and that's why so many of them died. And then, as we get into the colder months, well, there's not salt because there's so much fresh water coming down from the mountains. Snow melt in the spring brings more. So this is happening every year, and this might be what happened to cause so many colonists to die. Mary continues to test samples of river water every week, looking for the patterns of salinity throughout the seasons. This is a refractometer. It's an instrument that measures how much salt is in the water. And we call that salinity. Well, the thing is, it works because of refraction. Some of you might remember that if, if light goes through something that's very dense, then it's gonna be bent, the light rays will bend. So refraction means bending the light. And the more salt in the water, the more the light bends, and that will show up in here on a little scale. We measure salinity or salt in parts per thousand. So keep that in mind. The ocean is 35 parts per thousand. So that gives us something to compare it to. So now I got river water, which I'm gonna put right on here. Hope that's not too much. And then we're gonna just put the whole part down and we'll see how that works. And then we're gonna look up to the sky and it is only about one part per thousand so it's hardly salty at all and what kind of changes have you seen this year well it was all zero from from january all the way until july and in july the end last week in july it got up to two parts per thousand not very much it wouldn't even taste salty but by September, it got a lot saltier. It got up to 14 parts per thousand, then it dropped to 12 parts per thousand, and then we had the hurricane, and all that water came in and it dropped to zero. 1607, they were in the middle of a drought. How might that have affected the well, water? If there's a drought, that means it's not raining, which means there's not as much fresh water entering the river. You have to think about all the little streams and rivers that come all the way from the mountains of Virginia, even across the Valley and Ridge. All of that is flowing into this river. So when there are droughts, you just don't get as much fresh water. 
but ocean tides are still coming in every day high tides and low tides and high tides bring the salt so depending on if the drought lasts a long time the river will get very very salty and it'll get to the point that will cause you to have serious diseases and die in 1610 William Strachey reflected on three difficult years he compared the survival of those at Jamestown to those near the falls of the James River, modern day Richmond. If it had been our fortunes to have seated upon some hill accommodated with fresh springs and clear air, as do the natives of the country, we might have, I believe, well escaped. Although the Jamestown colonists didn't quite understand the science behind the river, they did realize that moving their settlements upriver made for healthier communities. As we still need fresh and clean water today, modern scientists are still working to understand the complexities of the Chesapeake Bay estuary. Thank you for watching this episode of Hands-On History, and we look forward to seeing you next time.